For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Start by just thanking uh, our speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Thank leadership uh, of the Senate, particularly Chuck Schumer, uh, for the stimulus bill uh, that was just announced. Uh, we are hopeful uh, that it will not only pass, but hopeful it will fulfill the promises uh, that are being made in terms of its impact. No one is naive about the magnitude of this crisis, and uh, I'm not suggesting that the magnitude of this stimulus will even meet the moment. I certainly uh, have strong points of view that they'll need to be more in the future. Uh, but let me just acknowledge good work, and let me just acknowledge progress. Uh, and that progress is manifest. The state of California, uh, by our back of the envelope estimate, as we process more of the details of the stimulus bill, will be the beneficiary of over $10 billion just in the state block grant portion uh, of the package. Some $5.5 billion alone will go to the state itself. Uh, the rest will go to our cities and counties. That does not include all of the other specific, uh, very direct support uh, that is also part of the stimulus bill. Uh, this bill will be very helpful and is very timely as we're in the process of distributing billions and billions of dollars of cash to procure uh, PPE, to procure locations and sites, to secure uh, the safety, the public health and safety of the people of the state of California. So on behalf of the nation's largest state, uh, as governor of the world's fifth largest economy, the state of California, uh, let me applaud the speaker, applaud Senator Schumer applaud the Democratic leadership and the compromise that was advanced with Republicans uh, for meeting this moment, noting that this moment in a week or two uh, may necessitate further moments of support, particularly to individuals, not just states, not just to businesses, not just to industries, but to individuals themselves that have been most impacted uh, by this virus. And let me be specific about what I mean by that. Uh, we're very pleased with the increase in unemployment benefits, up to $600 on top of what states are already providing. In the state of California, uh, we provide on a weekly basis unemployment insurance grants from anywhere from $40 to as much as $450. And this package would provide for an additional $600 on top of that, so for over $1,000 a week uh, for many Californians. And by the way, the reason I say it's timely, we just passed the one million mark in terms of the number of claims just since March 13th. One million Californians have now claimed the need to get unemployment insurance, so this cannot happen soon enough. But the magnitude of what happened in 2008 is still manifest for millions of Californians. We still have people that are struggling to get back to where they were before the Great Recession that most recently was defined by Lehman Day, September 15th, 2008, which marked an important moment. People are older and still struggling. And so these are individuals that once again are disproportionately being impacted uh, by this moment. And that's why I say we need to focus on those faces, on their stories, not just the face of government, not just the face of business, but on the faces of individuals day in and day out that are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to feed their family, to feed themselves, to get to the needs of their small businesses. Small businesses need more support. Small business is not something for me that's an abstract. I am proud to have created 23 small businesses in the state of California and employed hundreds and hundreds of workers. I have deep appreciation and respect for the entrepreneurs throughout this country and certainly in the state of California. And I can assure you, even with the significant improvements uh, advanced by leadership of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, we still need to do more for small business, for nonprofits uh, and others. So again, I want to just compliment uh, the work that was done 
uh, we are very supportive here in the state of California of advancing uh, this bill and having that stimulus uh, do the work that we are all hopeful it will do in real time. Uh, we've had wonderful conversations, by the way, to that end. Just got off the phone with Senator Harris, who's been an extraordinary leader for our state, uh, working uh, hand in hand with our partners uh, throughout state agencies, local agencies and nonprofits to work to delineate exactly what we needed to prioritize Senator Feinstein accordingly. And I can't say it enough, the incredible leadership of Speaker Nancy Pelosi. But when we talk about unemployment insurance, we talk about a $600 increase uh, beyond what states are already providing on a weekly basis for the next four months. Uh, that doesn't mean much when you are facing the burden uh, and the costs associated with, for example, your mortgage. Uh, residential mortgages being top of mind, I imagine, for families all across not only this state but across the country. Over the course of the last few weeks, we've been sitting down with banks large and small, credit unions large and small throughout the state of California and been in contact with national bank and CEOs uh, around the United States. I personally have had conversations with the heads of J.P. Morgan, the head of U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, a number of other of our nation's largest institutions uh, in state banks like East West Bank here in the state of California. Some 200 state chartered banks and credit unions have committed to the state of California uh, that they will provide forbearance, forbearance on foreclosures and on mortgage payments. That is significant. But the nation's bank, so we were encouraged to do the same. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, uh, Citi, and J.P. Morgan Chase uh, have all agreed to 90-day uh, waiver of payments for those that have been impacted by COVID-19. And that's an important point to make. Uh, it is significant. Uh, that we have some consistency. It's significant that we don't have a patchwork one bank to another. That's what happened in 2008. Credit unions doing one thing, banks doing another, state banks doing something altogether different. So we wanted to engage our nation's largest banks uh, and see if we would create some continuity, some consistency across their ranks. And four of the five largest institutions committed to just that, that 90-day. Unfortunately, Bank of America did not publicly commit to that. They just committed to 30 days. I hope they will reconsider and join uh, those other banks uh, that are willing to do the right thing by at least extending that commitment uh, to their customers uh, for 90 days. While the state of California doesn't have regulatory oversight of those banks, I'm sensitive uh, to that, and I know that the banks certainly are sensitive to that. Uh, they are also recognizing the sensitivity to their customers, uh, not just on the issue of being able to pay their mortgages and having a grace period for 90 days, but also on credit ratings. And that's also part of the broader uh, commitment that we uh, have secured uh, by those nations for those five largest our nation's banks and all of the state charter banks and credit unions, counting 200 plus. And so I, I wanna just compliment them uh, for their willingness to engage us and our team, Ben Chita, uh, Commissioner Alvarez, and others that have been working overtime uh, to organize these principles and advance them. We're working on additional issues and get continuity and consistency on ATM fees, on overdraft charges as well, uh, and we'll be announcing more details on that in the coming days. I also, though, recognize, uh, while significant, to have that continuity uh, as it relates to residential mortgages. Uh, as a small business person, uh, you're wondering, as a nonprofit leader, as a church leader, you're wondering uh, what's in store in terms of next announcements, next steps for you. And know in real time, we are also working with those same institutions to socialize some continuity uh, and some consistency uh, to help you as well. So no, the job is not done. We're not naive, uh, but we think this is a significant announcement. It's not just a release. Uh, it is a significant uh, a framework uh, to advance commitments uh, that we uh, have absolute certainty are real based upon personal commitments that I received directly uh, from the leaders of these companies, again, uh, with the exception, unfortunately, of the Bank of America. 
I also want to just make uh, a few comments about the work the state of California is doing uh, to meet this moment as it relates to the needs for uh, personal protective gear, as it relates to anticipating our surge capacity. I made an announcement a couple days ago uh, that we're looking to additional 50,000 uh, hotels or rather uh, units for support from hotels, motels, skilled nursing facility, uh, and uh, our hospitals to find additional bed capacity uh, for acute care throughout the state of California. In terms of that 50,000 number, 30,000 uh, was going to come from an increase of capacity within our hospital system, roughly 40% increase in their capacity and their footprint, uh, and the rest would come 20,000 from the state of California. I'm pleased today that Seton Hospital was one of those early announcements we made. We were able to get a lease on Seton, and Seton now is already operational today. That's a significant milestone. Uh, we're not just having conversations in the abstract about finding and procuring assets, but the human resources necessary to operate those assets. And that is the significance of Seton today. Uh, it is being now staffed by the extraordinary heroes, our nurses and doctors, uh, and we have at least the first tranche of appropriate personal protective gear uh, that is available at that site. Uh, St. Vincent down in LA was another one of our announcements and we're working to do the same there. And of course, the number of other hospitals uh, that we have also identified and are in the process either of having already taken the physical asset over and in the process of securing the staffing, but also advanced conversation on a number of other hospitals, including CPMC in San Francisco, uh, to provide for more surge capacity. Uh, three sites already, Santa Clara, Riverside, and San Mateo, uh, where we're working either on the fair uh, grounds or working in the convention centers uh, to begin the process of converting uh, those larger field, uh, field medical stations that the president uh, was generously able uh, to procure and provide. Remember, eight of those are coming to the state of California. That's 2,000 additional medical beds. Those sites are already unpacking or in the process of being made operational. I mentioned yesterday, uh, I was very proud, and they're right behind me uh, here at our State Emergency Operations Center. We have the leadership of the USS Mercy uh, that are here, and we're working out the details and protocols with LA County, LA City, and LA Port uh, on making sure uh, that site is prepared and prepped for Friday's uh, arrival of that ship and Saturday, Sunday, as we begin to process uh, the possibility uh, of first individuals to come on board. The configuration, I know there's been a lot of reporting up to a thousand beds. A lot of those are bunk beds, may not be ideal. So the number will come down substantially from a thousand. It's still a work in progress and quite literally that's the progress that's being made in real time uh, here in our operations center. So we'll announce more on that in the coming days. I, I want folks to know that we have already distributed 24.2 uh, million N95 masks in the state of California. Uh, that is a significant number. It's still insignificant to meet our needs. Uh, I was very pleased today uh, in our last briefing, uh, we have now secured literally 100 million new N95 masks, which is not insignificant, but again, still requires us to secure and support additional procurement efforts. But that's good news. And for those healthcare leaders that are demanding more and deserve more, I want them to know uh, when those get off uh, the docks, when they get through the airport and customs, we're going to get them out as quickly as we humanly possibly can. Uh, those procurements are not just limited to N95 masks. Those include coveralls and gowns uh, and shields and the like, uh, and we'll make those numbers public uh, as well uh, for those uh, that are interested. But no, this Herculean effort is underway and it is taking real shape. Uh, I'll just be even more specific. I mentioned uh, Sir Richard Branson and Virgin uh, and what they have committed to 747 to Hong Kong to come back into Oakland Airport. Uh, there's a million N95 masks that are part of that manifest, 150,000 testing kits that are also part of that manifest. This is all hands on deck, or at least on board, specifically to that 747. It's just indication 
of the work that's being done. Elon Musk announced officially a 1,225 ventilators. Uh, well, in excess of the 1,000 he said he was going to get us, he was able to find an additional 225 and distributed those uh, throughout our hospitals. I mentioned Bloom Energy. These folks deserve recognition. Uh, they are converting now about 30 a day uh, of our ventilators. Talk about repurposing a manufacturing plant to meet this moment. Uh, and we've got 30 of our 514 ventilators that were in our cache at EMSA uh, and CDPH, uh, and they are repurposing, uh, reconfiguring uh, those assets, and they, again, deserve credit. We speak about tests. I note that 150,000 uh, new test kits coming uh, because of the largesse of the partnerships with Kaiser, uh, with Apple, and Virgin doing substantively the logistics. Uh, the testing issues are incredibly important to Californians and Americans. Uh, we, uh, like others, have been very vocal about the issues in the last few weeks around reagents, RNA extraction kits, uh, and now with new technologies coming online, uh, higher processing speeds, automation, uh, the higher throughput that you've been hearing about all over the national news, uh, we're getting those uh, operations up and running. As a consequence, uh, we were able uh, to put together a new number in terms of the tests that have been conducted in the state of California. Uh, as of yesterday, that number is 66,800. It's 39,200 more than we had identified the previous day for a number of reasons. Uh, Kaiser is finally up and operational doing 12,000 tests in Northern and Southern California. All of these smaller labs coming online and finally uh, we've got reporting protocols that are feeding up into our system. We had the original 22 labs uh, that were reporting consistently. We then got the commercial labs, be it Quest or LabCorp, to start uh, reporting in. And then of course our academic institutions, our hospitals from Stanford, UC, our Sutter affiliates and Kaiser now more fully operational. This is including, uh, by the way, uh, Verily, the Google affiliate that's doing these field, field tests that now are not just operationalizing in the Bay Area, but now in Sacramento and Riverside. So more is being done in that space, but let me acknowledge in the outset 66,800 tests is not enough, and it's not enough for a reason that I mentioned yesterday and I'll report again today. And that is it's one thing to do the diagnostics, it's another to get word back on the test results. Uh, tens of thousands of those tests that I just mentioned are waiting uh, for the results to be finalized. The backlog now is not just on reagents uh, and RNA extraction kits and on the swabs themselves and the media to transport the swabs and the collection vials, but now also on the delay in getting the results of these tests. And so we are working overtime. I, we had a conversation today, a text exchange, the company it says they can provide them in 10 minutes. Others are providing technology, say we'll get them back in 45 minutes. We're just vetting those and we are working collaborative with our team. We've got a full-time task force just on testing protocols uh, to vet these technologies and make sure that we're not being taken advantage of because one thing we know in this environment, there are extraordinary people, and there are people uh, that do extraordinarily bad things. And so I also want to just extend, that doesn't just include interface with government, people claiming uh, that we need to send the equivalent of Bitcoin in advance to get some, uh, some materials uh, before they can send them and questionable activities like that. But I also want people to look out for your own consumer protection, more phishing, more cyber activity. Uh, don't just open any me email. Be thoughtful about your own personal protection, particularly as we move more and more online, distance learning, distance work, telework, telemedicine. We become more vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks, cyber hacking, but personal messages from strangers and the like. Just be careful before you provide your credit card, your social security number, your mother's maiden name, your first pet, whatever it may be. Uh, just make sure uh, that you're also uh, being thoughtful as we are as well as it relates to a tsunami of people claiming extraordinary things uh, that we have to vet and we have to test. Uh, those test results, by the way, uh, have come back in the state of California, uh, 2,000 
uh, 535 individuals as of this morning. And we use a point in time, 10 a.m., uh, on a daily basis, have tested positive in the state of California, 2,535 individuals. That's a 17% increase from the previous day. Tragically, 53 lives lost, including uh, that young person that uh, made national headlines yesterday. And uh, just a point of caution to all of us, and including my own team, um, we, uh, as I know people are eager to get information out in real time, and, and we are as well, and that obviously raised alarm bells across this country because this individual is 17 years old. I just want folks to know uh, there's a protocol and process now in investigating what occurred there with LA County, with CDC. Uh, and while it was reported to the state of California through the county, uh, that information, it was reported up. Uh, we all, I think, uh, are reminded uh, in this moment that uh, it's not just speed, it's accuracy uh, that must be front and center uh, in our public statements, in our deliberation, and, uh, and I take that to heart uh, as your governor as well. And so that's being investigated. Uh, we'll have nothing more to say on it until we get that information. But I can say this with accuracy. 37 people under the age of 17 in the state of California are part of those that have been tested positive in the state of California. So three dozen young folks have been tested positive. 51% as of today, over half, 18 to uh, 49 years old. Over half of you, 18 to 49, have tested positive. So these stay-at-home orders are real, and we want to maintain our vigilance. You know, it's interesting. We've been talking about the Olympics in this country. One of the things that all the greatest sprinters in the world have in common, they don't run the 90-yard dash. Let us not run the 90-yard dash on these stay-at-home orders, on home isolation. We can bend the curve. We can defeat this virus. But we can't defeat it unless we commit to fulfilling our individual obligations and our collective responsibilities to meet this moment. These stay-at-home orders are real. They are a bipartisan order. They're not a rural order and an urban order. They're not a Democratic order or a Republican order. The state of California and close to half now of the American people are living under some uh, frame of reference around home isolation. Let's meet this moment. Let's follow through. Halfway is no way. It is absolutely incumbent that we take seriously these orders. We're already seeing a little movement, even in the state of California, uh, and, and we just want folks to make the appropriate movement for essential business, essential support and services, and with intention, go outside, not uh, to congregate. And it's not just social distancing. I think in many ways that's a misleading uh, frame. It's physical distancing that we're after. In some ways, you shouldn't be socially distant from others because we're using different mechanisms to which we socially can engage. It's physical distancing. I'm just trying to use language that, you know, if I had a teenager, I have four young people, uh, kids, but they understand physical distancing more than they understand social distancing. So for the younger folks out there, physically separate from others and strangers. Don't mix and don't think for a second that we're a day or two away from lifting that order. We're not. We're not even a week or two away. California, can meet this moment. We've been leading in almost every category and other governors have done an extraordinary job and all of them deserve credit to some degree or another. And I'm proud to be part of those 50 state governors and their leadership. It is demonstrable and we are sharing best practices. But it is also incumbent upon us, having just left a conference call with a number of governors across the state, that those best practices include following through on these orders and directives uh, so that we can get through, maximize the short term so we can minimize the long term impacts. And you have to focus on economics by focusing on health first. And we must focus on meeting this health crisis so we can ultimately address the economic uh, challenges that are self-evident in the stimulus package and in my admonition that it still needs to go farther for individuals and people into the future. Final point. Um, I was very pleased today. We got our new number, homeless individuals that have the capacity now uh, to get more support and resources. Uh, we talked about 2,400 beds 
uh, that were made available for homeless individuals. In some counties, they're not just using them for the homeless, uh, but they have the capacity to do that. Uh, we now have 4,305 hotel rooms uh, in our portfolio, and we're making those available all across the state in real time. Uh, and thank you to LA and thank you to Sacramento. Uh, they have identified the exact sites of where the trailers will go, and we're getting those 1,305 trailers. I said 1,309. We lost five trailers. That's another conversation, but I want to be precise and specific. Uh, we have over 1,300 trailers that will be going out, and as soon as those counties provide uh, more information, we'll get those uh, support services out. So I just wanted to mention that uh, as well. So that's, uh, in broad strokes, an update. Uh, on a number of issues, and uh, I just continue to be very proud uh, of our hospitals, our nurses, our doctors, our, our frontline employees that are doing an amazing job, including uh, those that work for the state of California uh, that are meeting the moment, from our budget team uh, to other agency directors and, uh, that uh, are, are struggling to keep up uh, but are doing their best under very challenging circumstances. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Los Angeles Times. Uh, Governor, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the, uh, there are some housing advocates and state lawmakers who have called for a statewide moratorium on evictions of renters. And I know before you put out a directive encouraging uh, counties and, and cities to look at that, but uh, the complaint is that there's a patchwork of policies. It's not really consistent. When are you going to address that, and do you support a statewide uh, moratorium on evictions, and why haven't you called for that? Yeah, so uh, for three days in a row consecutively, I've said the following. Let me say it on the fourth day. Uh, we are very concerned about what's happening or not happening at the local level. Uh, we reserve our right, as I said when I put out the first directive, uh, to clarify the legal authority of local government. Uh, that was not clear before that executive order came out to advance their own uh, moratorium on evictions. Uh, that if we don't see things materialize and manifest in very short order, uh, we'd reserve the right to look at a state overlay. I said two days ago, uh, in addition to what I just told you, uh, I said that we have a team reviewing the legal parameters related to that issue. Issues are much more complicated than they may appear uh, for me, it's practice, uh, not promise. And so we're looking at takings clauses, issues related uh, to law, unintended intended consequences. Uh, and the team uh, is working overtime uh, to uh, work through those issues. When I have clarity on those legal parameters, other states I know have done versions of this, but the state of California has its unique set of circumstances. Uh, we will provide clarity, uh, and I will be very direct with you on the answer. Uh, those same individual legislators that are writing that public letter have directly uh, contacted me, so um, I am already, quote unquote, in receipt of their point of view and well aware of that anxiety. I also am very proud of the announcements I made today as it relates to residential mortgages. I think that is a significant step, and I hope it's also a demonstrable example that we mean business at this moment, and we are leaning in to meet this moment, uh, and that is another area uh, where I can assure you we're leaning in, and hopefully within the next day or two, we'll have absolute clarity on next steps. Doug Sovereign, KCBS. Governor, can you hear me? Perfectly. Hi, Governor, can you hear me? Oh, yes, Doug, absolutely. Hi, Governor, thank you. And uh, you know, I just want to say also on behalf of my reporting colleagues, um, we really appreciate the opportunity to ask questions whenever you have one of these briefings, since we can't be in the same room, so thanks for making that possible. But uh, as you know, um, the hospitals are all bracing for a surge that they think could be coming in the next week or two in, in California. And I'm wondering if you have a sense um, as to how much we are bending the curve or flattening the curve, and maybe that surge won't happen or it won't be as bad as they fear, or what your thoughts are on is that surge coming and is what we're doing making a difference? We're, we're preparing always for the worst, and I want folks to know, I, I, you know, some people say, well, is he, are we being honest about the worst-case scenario? Are we overstating 
some people say, are we understating? Uh, we're going forward as transparent way as possible uh, with the best estimate based on real-time data collection, real-time information. I talked about the need to potentially have the capacity of 125,000 uh, rooms within our hospital and acute care system. Uh, that's the 50,000 that I was referring to a moment ago. I talked about how we're breaking that down between what the hospitals, the 416 hospitals themselves would do and what the state of California is doing. I specifically laid out today that Seton is now open. It's not at the capacity it will be uh, over the course of the next days and weeks, uh, but it is open and what we're doing at St. Vincent, what we're doing to get CPMC on board and what we're doing down in Long Beach uh, with the mayor's consent and support, their community hospital and hospitals in the Central Valley in addition to those eight medical field hospitals that were procured uh, through FEMA and the federal government. Uh, and so all that are being packaged, and here's the good news. Um, our hospitals right now are, are in better position to meet a week or two of a worst case scenario than they have been. Uh, our ICUs as well, the new ventilators that we've been able to procure in addition to the 7,587 that we started with within the hospital system. We're starting to get those new ventilators uh, that we've been speaking of. I included, by the way, yesterday 170 that came from the federal government down to LA County uh, in that total number. Uh, we've got more protective gear that we're getting out and can't get out soon enough. And I talked about that 100 million just in the N95 masks that we've already identified and locked down uh, that is making its way into the state of California. So uh, we hope we can meet this moment. I'm sober about it. I'm deeply proud of our planning efforts. And I say this not as a point of critique, not as a point uh, of, of uh, well, not to make any other point. We're going to own this moment. Uh, I'm not interested in pointing fingers and abdicating responsibility. We're going to own this moment. We need help wherever we can find it, but we're a nation state, and we are resourceful beyond words, and, and, and we're going to meet this moment. And so I say that to answer your concern or your question, the subtext of it, uh, is if we see things doubling every few days like they have in New York, uh, I feel like we're getting these assets in place so that we can at least buy ourselves some time as we procure all of these other resources in real time. Adam Bean, Associated Press. Hi, Governor. I'm um, curious about the uh, mortgage waiving wave of the mortgage fees. What are the, uh, would there be any income requirements or other type of requirements applied for this? I mean, you said earlier it was for people impacted by the virus, but you know, the virus has really impacted everybody. Yeah, no, there's no income. Uh, provisions uh, that are part of the announcement we made today. So the answer to the question is no, uh, but it is COVID related and some form of documentation. And we want to ease the document side of this. And I can assure you, one of the great critiques post 2008 was the laborious processing back and forth with documentation. And we've been working with the big five banks for that are doing the right thing and all of our state chartered banks to reduce the paperwork uh, and significantly ease this process. I want to say, though, in order to ease the process, let me encourage you as a consumer that may be hearing this or reading about it, uh, if every single person with a residential mortgage makes a phone call at the same time to their bank, those call centers will collapse. So I hope folks take a little bit of time, pause, get their documents in order, put everything together so that when they do make those calls, someone A will answer that uh, and B uh, that uh, they'll answer that in a way where you can get the response you want uh, without having to spend 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes on hold or uh, in a conversation. So I, I know the bank CEOs were quite candid with me about concern around surge. Uh, and I express deep appreciation about that just with our uh, unemployment insurance call volume, which has been overwhelming. Uh, and I hope uh, consumers will consider that as well. Elix Michelson, Fox 11. Michelson, thank you so much for taking uh, our calls. Um, there's been a bit of a controversy in L.A. County, California's largest county, over the issue of gun stores. The sheriff here says he believes that they're non-essential and would like to shut them down, but he says that there's been some confusion over your guidance on this issue. Do you believe that gun stores themselves are essential businesses that should remain open during this time? Well, I may be the last person to ask this question in past 
a statewide initiative to become the first state in American, America to do background checks, not just on guns, but ammunition purchases. Uh, I believe people's right to bear arms, uh, and I believe uh, that people are exercising that right. Uh, but I'll defer to the sheriff in this instance, and I'll defer to sheriffs uh, in their respective jurisdiction for that clarification. Laura Mahoney, Bloomberg Law. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the federal relief package has a lot of tax changes for individuals and businesses involving items like 401k distributions, charitable contributions, student loan payments, net operating losses, and even a tax waiver for making hand sanitizer. And I'm wondering if you will push for California to conform to those changes, um, and that would mean getting the lawmakers to do it. Yeah, the answer is uh, we will see. Uh, we are in quite literally real time processing the details and nuances and translating into uh, the state budget what this federal support looks like in a granular level. We'll see where the gaps are. Uh, I've expressed concerns uh, that even with the substantial increase in unemployment insurance benefits, it's still not going to be good enough uh, for millions of Californians. I've expressed concern about the small business supports uh, and the like. Uh, so we will process that. We will make an assessment and determination. Uh, I should just note, while we are a nation state that was running surpluses up until uh, a few weeks ago and record reserves and bond rating that increased on multiple occasions because of the fiscal prudence and the economic vibrancy of the state, uh, the economic impacts to the budget uh, were self-evident yesterday when I announced basically a baseline budget into the new year uh, that will impact uh, the budget uh, proposals that we advanced in our January uh, uh, numbers. And so it gives you an indication that we will have to look through this uh, very thoughtfully and process each and every example. But committing to conformity across the board is not something at the moment uh, any governor, humbly, I submit, should do, and I certainly won't until we get those facts. Ashley Zavala, Crown 4. Hi, Governor. I just wanted to check in because I know last night you said you would have hospitalization or recovery rates um, as as it relates to California's numbers and just seeing if you had those today. Yeah, it looks like we're going to get them this afternoon, but Dr. Galley can talk a little bit more about that and forgive us starting a little earlier than we had anticipated yesterday. Doctor? So, uh, thank you, Governor. We continue to work with our hospital partners and health delivery partners to clarify our data. We know we're tracking some of the hospitalizations for COVID-19 patients and those in the ICUs. We want to give the public a complete picture across the California, not just in those hotspot areas that we've been tracking, and we expect to have those through our many partnerships um, over the course of the next couple of days so the governor can keep the public abreast of the situation in our facilities. Yeah. So we were hoping to have those numbers this morning, uh, but we'll get those as quickly as we can. Again, uh, in the spirit, I, I have estimates. I don't like the estimates. We, we're going to get clarification uh, on some of these numbers uh, and get the specifics. And until I have that, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to hold the current ones back. Alexi Kosef, SF Chronicle. Hi, Governor. Could you uh, please clarify why the reported number of uh, tests? seems to have tripled from yesterday. What is, I mean, what is the... the well, this is exactly what I told you would happen over the course of the last number of days. Uh, we have been getting all of the new testing information back uh, from some of the largest providers of tests in the state of California. I was very specific a moment ago. You heard me discuss specific number, 12,000 tests that came from Kaiser, both in Northern and Southern California. Uh, that is one example. Kaiser just came on board. Number of other providers just came on board. And the collection protocols, when a new provider comes up, uh, we've got to engage them and we've got to give them the guidance on exactly what we want. A lot of new providers, small labs, only submit positive tests 
not just negative tests. Uh, and a lot of folks are sitting on paperwork. So there's quite literally dozens and dozens now of these providers all throughout the nation state of California. And so those protocols are, are being advanced. Each time someone comes online, we're making sure that they're in line uh, with our collection data. So over the course of last week, we've been scrubbing uh, all of those and getting uh, down uh, into some of the smallest collection labs uh, in order to make sure that everybody is on the same page. I should note uh, those numbers will continue to lag because in real time people are coming online with more, more, new testing technology and the like. Uh, but the spike was exactly what we anticipated uh, and it was 39,200 more uh, than yesterday's uh, numbers. Uh, and it's about in line with what we expected, but it is not good enough. We want to see more tests in the state of California smarter, more targeted testing, more community surveillance. It is critical uh, that we do that. Uh, and we are being very bold in some of our discussions around procurement of new technologies. Uh, and we are committed to making some very significant advancements, not just waiting uh, for federal uh, supports in this space, but to take more aggressive actions as new technologies are presenting themselves in real time from around the world, uh, and we are currently vetting them uh, to consider the procurement of those technologies. Hannah Wiley, Safi. Hi, Governor. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with us as usual. Um, it seems like school districts have um, many different plans to keep kids learning, um, but has there been any guidance from the administration on uniform K through 12 instruction, or have your advisors for these districts, uh, or have your advisors um, offered any assistance to these districts to handle the new normal of online instruction? Yeah, as you recall, um, many days ago, uh, through the direction of Linda Darlene Hammond, our superintendent of public education, Tony Thurman, uh, my own team led by Ben Cheetah and others, uh, we put together a strike team, a task force. Uh, we were quite specific with you in the media. We said uh, that we would need a few days to put out guidance uh, to uh, the thousand school districts across the state of California. We met that timeline. We put out very detailed guidance. We broke that guidance down into four or five categories, well beyond the issues of distance learning to the issues of food distribution and procurement uh, and the like. We got the legislature, credible leadership of Tony Atkins, Anthony Rendon, to put an additional $100 million of emergency aid that we now have made available to the school districts for personal protective gear, for cleaning protocols. So for those sites that are still operational for online or distance learning uh, and or for food distribution, that those sites are safe. And so those protocols, those processes, those procedures are available uh, and we distribute them throughout the school system, recognizing that we are many parts but one body, meaning one size does not fit all. And these were guidelines and uh, not directives in this sense, that if you're in Tulare County uh, or you're near Visalia, it's a very different condition and environment in terms of resources community resources uh, and on-site school resources than perhaps in some other large urban or suburban district. And so that's why our directives were quite nuanced. But I would direct you uh, to those guidelines which are available uh, on our websites and across the board. Uh, just Google uh, those guidelines. And if you need any help, direct them to my office and I'll get my team to get them to you specifically. Katie Orr, KQED. Hi, Governor. Um, because of social distancing, obviously signature gathers for November ballot initiatives can't be out on the streets collecting those signatures. Do you have any intention of pushing the deadline uh, by when they have to have those signatures gathered? Uh, and then are you uh, concerned about the November election in general and any impact that uh, COVID-19 might have on it? We've been very close contact with our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. Uh, who has really leaned into this moment and has been providing me almost on a daily basis of thoughts and insight in terms of protecting and securing not just the November ballot, but our special election. And as you know, uh, we have a number of special elections in May. Uh, we put out a directive a few days ago on the special elections and what the new protocols and processes will be, particularly as it relates to supporting our mail-in ballots. Uh, 
Alex Padilla is doing just that more broadly uh, at a scale in the November election, and we're scoping those things out, helping him resource ideas in terms of the magnitude of what that means. Of course, he's working county by county uh, with district election offices uh, to make sure that their needs are met as well. So just know that process continues. As it relates to signature gatherers, let me get back to you on that. A number of people have inquired about that, not surprisingly from the industry, and it is an industry, uh, these, these collections. Uh, and we've got many things we're processing. That's one of them, but I don't have any new information to provide you at this time. Nicole Nixon, Capital Public Radio. Hi, Governor. Uh, you've talked about some of these new test kits coming in from overseas. What areas are most in need of those? And is mass temp testing something you still want to see? Is something that could still be feasible? Yeah, as I said a moment ago, uh, we want to significantly improve our community surveillance testing in the state of California, more targeted testing. Testing, uh, we have to change the nomenclature on testing. It's not just about the numbers. It's about what, where, when, and why? What's the purpose? What's the intent of the testing protocols? What are we trying to ultimately achieve beyond just diagnostics for critical care needs, which is a medical need, which self-evidently is a top priority for people with symptoms, people that are presenting themselves in our hospital system, people that are in vulnerable populations, those uh, with issues obviously related uh, to previous conditions and obviously age. Uh, but we really want to start testing and retesting people. And this is an incredibly important point. Just because you had a test that's negative doesn't mean the next time you get a test, you're going to be negative. Just at that moment, you're negative. But moments after the test results come back, you may uh, be uh, in a position where you are saying, well, I guess I'm fine now. I can run around and you know, go on a nice hike and run into people. Uh, you may need to be retested. Also, we want to test people not only multiple times, broadly in terms of the mass testing protocols and procedures, which ultimately is the goal to the question uh, that you asked. But we want to keep retesting people uh, that have recovered so we can learn more uh, about the specifics uh, of their experience. And the sum total of that data will be profoundly important. You're seeing that uh, around the rest of the world. A lot of those technologies are being presented in states, large and small, and obviously to the FDA. Uh, and to the federal administration and their task force led by Vice President Pence. And also, they're going direct to states like ours uh, with very specific technologies. I should extend those technologies aren't only swab-based, aren't only on the base of how current specimen samples are being provided. Uh, people are coming in with all kinds of novel testing strategies that don't require that, that are blood-based. Others uh, are looking at protocols and uh, therapeutics that aren't uh, even traditional dosages uh, that may actually include stem cell uh, capacity. This is the center, and I encourage the press, really, this is an opportunity if, to lean in. Uh, this is the center of uh, the universe when it comes to biotherapeutics, bioinnovation. Uh, we are the birthplace of biotech, the state of California. I remind you, Gilead and Genentech, Genentech founded in 1979 here in the Bay Area. Uh, they're headquartered here in the state, working with the finest research institutions in the world, among the finest in the world. And so there's a lot that's happening in this space, a lot of deep trials that have already been advanced, uh, CEDARS, USC, Stanford, not just our UCs. Uh, and we've been having just wonderful and dynamic conversations around what's happening in that space. But it also includes the testing space. And I can assure you our commitment is to massively increasing the testing capacity, protocols, procedures, and targets. Final question, Jeremy White, Politico. Hey, Governor, thanks, as always, for talking to us. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Hannah's question about um, school and Jeremy, I'm, and Jeremy, this is not because I don't want to answer a school question. Uh, literally, you're breaking up. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Let's try to we'll get back to you. Why don't we offline? get back to you, Jeremy, specifically. And let's have one more question if someone else is on the line. Anita Shabria, LA Times. 
Hi, Governor. Thanks a lot. Um, can you give us a little bit more insight into the numbers that you have that your modeling today is based on? I understand the limitations of the testing, but you have doubled hospital beds. Are you looking at doubling rates? Are you looking at how many positives we have um, percentage-wise? What do you know about how the disease is moving through California? Yeah, no, that's, I'm going to leave that to Dr. Galley, who's running all of these protocols, and he can talk more specifically about that. So uh, a number of weeks ago, we did work on a uh, sort of homegrown, first in the nation, really, model uh, around what the impact, knowing what we were learning from many of the repatriation efforts that California was leading and how the disease was starting to come into the state, beginning to be contained at first, and then as we moved into community spread, tracking methodically all of the cases, where they were across the state, contact tracing, et cetera. Using that information, refining our model, inviting our academic partners, not just here in California, but from across the country and the globe, to begin to refine that model and build it around our current data. Data from Santa Clara in particular, what we were seeing in some of their big hospitals, whether those were individuals who were coming into their, their emergency rooms with influenza-like illnesses, those who were eventually tested positive and or negative for COVID-19, those who ended up into the ICU. Unfortunately, the growing number of individuals were dying from the disease. And we take that information every single day with those initial rates of globally incorporated attack rates, what we were seeing in other countries, and we continue to build our model. And today, we feel like we're looking at our doubling rate. We originally thought that it would be doubling every six to seven days. We see cases doubling every three to four days. And we're watching that trend very, very closely. And the critical information that the governor has said he will get the public on number of people in the hospitals, number of people in ICUs, and the overall testing rate and the rate positive is going to continue to allow us to refine this model and work towards whether that 50,000 number in surge capacity that the governor has tasked us to create for the state of California with our wonderful partners. Is that enough? When do we need it? And we are on track given our current estimates of where we are. We believe that through the ongoing refinement of those numbers, looking at whether the social distancing efforts across the, st across the state are working, understanding what the trends are, not just in those hospital rates, but things like coal centers for colds, fever, that helps us model this as well. And we're watching those trends. The governor mentioned that we have early signs that some of those efforts are making a difference. And we believe that's true in certain pockets of the state. And we believe also that our hospitals, because of their forward thinking nature, have helped to do a lot to prepare for the surge that we anticipate in a week or two, maybe a little further out if we continue doing a good job on social distancing, physical distancing really, I appreciate that, that, that pivot and frame, I think that's exactly right. And that we will continue to build these models and look at it. And I think right now we believe that 50,000 number is exactly where we need to be for phase one and that our hospitals doing the great work that they're doing now we're no, we, we couldn't be better positioned for what we anticipate could be coming. Whether that comes or not in the full sort of nature that we anticipate is in large part um, up, up to us. That personal responsibility with physical distancing is going to be critical, and we're going to be watching that closely. And trust me, we'll let the governor know. Uh, continuing to update you on how we're doing with that when we have to dig in a little bit more so we can stick to this model, not only flatten that curve, but stay ahead of what we see coming. And uh, um, thank you for that. And we'll just wrap up. And let me wrap up just on that point. I, you've heard me use this phrase many times. I can't repeat it enough. Um, the future is not just something to experience. We're not along for the ride. I completely reject this notion that somehow we are destined to any particular fate. Uh, it is decisions, not conditions, that determine our fate and future. And it's a sum total of millions of individual decisions. And that's why we can't let up on the good decision making that we've seen the overwhelming majority of Californians over the course of the last few weeks. We would like to believe 
that that's had an impact. In fact, we know it's had an impact uh, on bending that curve and buying us time. And every day, we don't see a spike. Every day, that is another day that we're getting more assets, more physical and human resources prepared for a worst case scenario to save people's lives and to meet this moment. So let's not let up. Uh, let us uh, commit uh, to this uh, home uh, isolation and this physical distancing. Let's not be interested in doing so. Let's commit to doing so. And if we do, uh, then uh, we, I think, will have a tremendous impact on mitigating uh, what some people assume is a worst case scenario that is inevitably going to come our way. We don't live under assumptions. We live under real data trend lines and real application of responsible ways of impacting those trends so that we can model uh, a day where we are back uh, to work and this economy is back on track and millions of Californians are safe and healthy. Thank you all very, very much. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.